اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم i begin as i always begin in the name of allah whose grace i seek in this and all other matters um i have the distinct honor and pleasure of um this inaugural meeting for what i'm going to be calling friends along the way where i will be holding uh zoom meetings with um amazing people that i have met uh on the path to gender justice uh in islam and so it is appropriate that this first one be with the first two women that i knew as scholars who used the phrase islamic feminism and that was some 30 years ago i'm going to introduce them one by one especially for uh people who are new uh first is uh dr margo badran who has a diploma from al azhar and a uh ma from uh, middle east studies from harvard university and a uh phd in middle eastern history from oxford uh among her titles are feminist islam and nation and feminism in islam uh she has been teaching islam feminism at university of chicago northwestern and as a visiting scholar she has done public lectures and university lectures at um universities in the middle east africa south asia southeast asia and parts of the us as well uh, as part of the um us cultural uh programming um margo will uh share with you a little bit about uh the ups and downs of this journey um last week margo and i were on zoom for about two and a half hours just the two of us i just adore uh, talking with her because she has such uh, an astute perspective having been a historian for more than 50 years um i don't want to age you margo but um i really appreciate that uh you were in it before any of us knew that we should be in it so you know you have the you have the floor please oh you are, okay <laughs> uh thank you very very much amina for organizing this it's very very exciting and it's amazing you know to be here all these decades you know half a century later well the three of us go back three decades and we actually go back to the beginning of the emergence of islamic feminism as a named phenomenon even though all of us didn't go for the name and uh, so it's hard to know where to begin and where to end and i was terrified because you would made you said we have 15 minutes i mean 15 minutes for 30 years and 50 years is a little bit much but anyway um i wanted to uh, throw out a few things and then in conversation we can develop strands that are of interest to people but i think it's a good chance for us to talk about the human side and the friendship side which isn't you know evident um in our uh, you know articles and productions and often we don't i mean we don't usually have the chance to speak this way except you know privately as you mentioned when we had this recent conversation but basically i came to islamic feminism through the door of sec of muslim women's secular feminism and this secular feminism was specifically the feminism i discovered and found and dug deep into in egypt and this was a feminism within an islamic framework or there was islam within this feminism along with secular nationalism and humanitarianism and so on so but it was in the feminism really inspired in part by islamic modernism it had its limits in terms of gender equality issues uh now in the 19 so i was doing this uh, this research into the first wave of feminism in the first half of the uh, 20th century by the time, by the 1980s i decided i wanted to know more about what was happening in contemporary egypt um and so i looked around for you know signs of what was going on in feminist thinking and activism in circles and so on and i started to discover that there was some in uh, some investigation of the quran in 
for uh, understanding a kind of gender equality, women's rights, but much more grounded in the Quran. And I remember Heba Rauf saying to me, I use the Quran as, uh, the Quran is my dictionary. My, and so uh, I picked up on this and had gone immediate, went immediately afterwards to this conference that uh, Val Mogadam was organizing, or was holding in, in Helsinki. Uh, and uh, it was on identity politics and women. And so there was a lot of discussion about the bad news and how you know a neo patriarchy was taking over in the guise of Islam. And I had gone there so excited because I had discovered sort of what, what were in a way roots or inklings of what became Islamic feminism. So now let me zoom up to the 19, 1996. 1996 was an amazing year because that was the year I met you, Amina, and I met you, Ziba, wherever Ziba is in the gallery. And I was teaching um, a course at Oberlin in 1996 on Middle East women and Islam. And after, at the end of the course, a woman came up to me and she said, first she said, um, I'm, I'm a Muslim, but I don't tell anybody, I'm in the closet. And it was very interesting why she said, I mean, she introduced herself that way. But back in those days, everybody was in some, I mean, so many people were in closets, you know, the closets were SRO, you know, for different <laughs> kinds of identities. In any case, so she said to me, um, I have this amazing book. I found this amazing book by someone called Amina Wadud and Quran and Woman. And so she lent it to me and I was totally blown away. I mean, it, it, from that time forward, I never taught the, same, the course the same way because I had much more ability to understand, you know, how we could understand Islam in a far more egalitarian way, apply it and so on. It was very, very exciting. I was very shaken. And the most amazing thing happened is that Amina appeared in Oberlin that very time. And she was invited, you told me, uh, by students. And so I got wind of it. And we had, I think, a very brief meeting. I don't think it was very, you know, that, that, it, that's in my memory. But anyway, the whole thing of meeting you, meeting the book first and then you. 1996 was also Ziba comes on, I mean, in my screen. And Ziba, remember your article, Stretching the Limits. And you were really the first person, one of the first, very first people who actually used the term Islamic feminist. And that blew me away again, because I didn't dare use it. You know, I mean, who am I to use that term? So, because I didn't want to be accused of a Western imperial, you know, all this kind of stuff. So anyway, Aziba is using the term uh, Islamic feminism, explaining why and, and talking about the folks at, at Zanan and how they're challenging the ideas that were being put forth as this post domain. So it was a very, very intense time, 1996. That was the origin of our coming together. Another thing, Ziba, I was thinking about is, is, is that your, your book, the book that you published um, at Princeton, give me the title itself, uh, you, we, you and I had the same um, editor, Mary Morell. That's and right, she yeah. said, oh, I've got this amazing book by a woman called Ziba Mir Husseini. <laughs> and she said, I love the name Ziba. Anyway, the thing was, so Ziba, through stretching the limits and through Mary and I talking about you, I mean, this opened up the gates, you know, to meeting you. And of course, back in those, not of course, but back in those days, and Amina will tell the story, she's made toward it many times, was not using the term Islamic feminism or feminist, and she wasn't identifying and so on. But that didn't stop us, you know, from having interactions and so on. And I don't have to tell the, uh, 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 Amina's story of when she came on board with the term. But anyway, I really want to sort of salute and thank you. And I'm so moved to be here after 30 years, who would have thought, especially with this COVID thing, and we're not moving around. And here we are gathered together by Amina. Um, and, the, and the story still continues. There's so much more about, it, you know, that I can't really say in these minutes. But, but I, the point was really to show how the three of us met. And then there are so many other linkages of meetings and personal interactions and through, we learn things, we learn about, you know, what 
people's work is we learn about activism, we get engaged, and uh, we share our stories. And so this is just a very quick uh, uh, sort of introduction to um, a very, very, very important meeting. And uh, I think I might have come to 15 minutes, Amina. No, you're actually uh, under by considerable. You're not even yet at 10 minutes. So why don't you oh my goodness. Can you talk a little bit about, this is one of the things in your work that was uh, very um, insightful for me and really helped me to locate myself. And that was uh, the different waves of feminism um, that you, know, you observed you know, in your work. Well, as I said, the, uh, the first wave, and my work was very much grounded in Egypt, although it spilled out into the greater Middle East. Uh, but the first wave was very much, uh, it was Muslim women and Coptic Christian women together in a feminist movement. And the Christian women were very supportive of uh, the Muslim women's uh, uh, demands for change in Akhwah Shaksiya. And, but the the overarching frame was the nation and society because both the Christians and Muslims suffered from a lot of the same patriarchal nonsense, really. And, uh, and Islam was very much part of this. So we zoom up to second wave feminism, which is um, in an organized sense appearing in the 1980s. And it also appears more or less simultaneously, although Islamic, uh, 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 political Islam, Islamism, is emerging in the 70s uh, already, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it, um, second wave feminism uh, was more articulated in quote unquote a secular language because earlier, for example, they had to say, okay, uh, you know, they had to legitimize, the feminists had to legitimize everything in Islamic or religious terms and for the cops. You know, it's okay to do, uh, have education, it's okay to work, um, and on and on and on. So you didn't need by the time of second wave feminism and also in asking for the vote. So by the second wave, you know, they have the vote, they're in the universities, they don't have to make these demands and they don't have to say we're there because Islam says such and such, we're just there. So a lot of this was already internalized and considered it was, you know, to be, to be okay. Now, at that moment, the Islamists were swiveling the term secular to make it anti-Islam, un-Islamic, and so on. So they changed the meaning. And that was also a way not only to get at the secular state, but to get at quote unquote secular feminism or feminism without a heavy articulate public or you know explicit articulation of religion. And um, so this created a lot of, of difficulties and a lot of defenses, uh, defenses, defenseism or defense apologetics and so on. And, but the thing is that that denigration or delegitimizing of the term secular has never really gone away. And it's had very bad implications inside the, the Muslim uh, context because there has been fighting, you know, secular against religious and I'm a believer and does so and so. There are people who are believers who don't say they're believers. And so it, it, it created a lot of stresses and strains and I got sort of swept up in, in the stresses and strains because I was, promoting secular feminism, I also declared myself an Islamic feminist. I didn't connect my Islamic feminism with an identity because it was a reading of the Quran, a reading of the text, uh, understanding what Amina said, understanding what Ziba was saying, the difference between fiqh and, uh, and sharia and all this sort of thing. So my identity did not impinge or it wasn't necessary for me to be a particular thing in order to read the text and understand it. And this is something I don't think we've fully gotten beyond and, and catch um, uh, this, you know, we're talking about diversity and inclusivity. And I think we don't have to put identity out there as a qualification to be able to read the Quran. And when Amina came along with the Tawhidic paradigm, Amina blew my hair off. Well, it grew back in, as you can see. But the thing is that that you know, being an insane was what it was. And I always thought I was an insane. And so she reminded me that I was, and that it was in an Islamic framework. So um, these are, you know, things that have, I've encountered, I've seen, and getting to the younger generation who, who were coming up. I mean, there's so many younger generations, where do you start? 
but in the early part of this century, you could start to see, because we had many international conferences in Paris and Barcelona, you name it, we had these conferences on, quote, on Islamic feminism. And there were different generations. And the younger people don't have, they're not as bogged down with our terminology and our, you know, uh, it, it, what we faced in terms of, of uh, of terms being shifted and moved and so on and, and you know, downgrading is, of secularism and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. So I, and also they, they have read your stuff. And I mean, they've read the history, they've read your things and so on. I remember when I was teaching at the University of Chicago and this woman was telling me in, in an exam paper, you know, it's talking about gender equality and justice and all this sort of, and I said, how, where did you, I mean, she was, she was, it was natural for her. I mean, it wasn't something she, she had to discover. I said, well, how, why are you saying all this? Because there were a lot of people in the room who were saying, you know, it's, you know, it's patriarchal and so on. And she, I said, where do you, and she cited your names and other people's names and Marnisi and so on. And so a lot of people now have texts that we didn't have. So um, that's where it is. Uh, I mean, I mean, I and I have gone on so many little rivulets, but but maybe with these sort of thoughts thrown out in the discussion, we can move further. But I do think inclusivity um, is something very big because, especially in the East Arab countries, not talking about the Jazeera, but you know, we have Muslims and Christians together, and there we're in it deep in what's going on. And uh, we cannot be divided, and we have to claim um, the territory. And we can talk about social justice and equality in multiple discourses. So maybe that's, uh, I think 15 minutes has come, right? Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I'm just trying to see that Amanda come, because there's nothing happening in the chat. I'm here. Oh, OK. Good so morning. Sorry, <laughs> this is Amanda. Um, I'm just going to repeat that because um, if you have a question for a particular speaker while she's speaking, you can put that question in the chat. And if you have a question but you don't want us to show your face or your name, because I do plan to share the recording public in about one week, um, then you can write your question in the chat and just put Anon, A-N-O-N, or the whole word anonymous. And um, uh, when we get to the discussion section, uh, that question can be read out without mentioning your name. Uh, if you are okay that your name gets mentioned but you don't want to show yourself, then uh, you can indicate in the chat that you um, have a question. Um, and then when you come to speak, don't turn your camera on. Um, and if you're okay to show your face and to uh, have your name be known, then, um, you know, when we get to the discussion section, that's your option. So I'm trying to respect people's privacy. Um, and at the same time, I just think that um, this is something that we should share to a larger audience. Um, so thanks, Margo. We'll get back to you. Uh, Dr. Ziba Mir Husseini is a legal anthropologist and a founding member of Musawa. She works as an independent researcher and scholar activist and has held numerous research fellowships and visiting professorships. Ziba has published books on Islamic family law in Iran and Morocco, Iranian clerical discourses on gender, Islamic reformist thinkers, and the revival of Zina laws. Her latest book, is the co-edited Men in Charge, Rethinking Male Authority in Muslim Legal Tradition. We have another one of the editors here in our gallery. She has also co-edited two award-winning feature-length documentary films on Iran, Divorce, Iranian Style, and Runaway. In 2015, she received the American Academy of Religion's Martin E. Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion. Uh, and I just have to tell my little antidote before she uh, kicks it off. Uh, I remember uh, every time I used to hear Ziba, I used to write copious notes. And I remember a colleague said to me, a male colleague, you know, 
why are you writing so many notes? Uh, Ziba's sense of organization really helped me, I think, uh, to clarify that I had a place in something called Islamic feminism. So I'm very happy to uh, give the floor to you. Ziba Jan. Thank you. It's, it's wonderful to have this conversation and to be here, you know, to revisit the, the roads that we uh, came together from different directions. Uh, and thank you, Amina, for organizing this. For me, uh, it all started with the Iranian Revolution, 1979. Before that, I was neither feminist or I didn't know anything about that kind of political Islam, which is imposed by state. I was a Muslim. But after the revolution, you know, I, I really came to see another face of Islam, imposition of the law, Sharia law from, what they called it Sharia law from above. So in 1980s, my research was focused on understanding our marriage and divorce in Islamic law. And as an anthropologist, I did not focus on the text, legislation, but just on marital disputes sitting in courts. And I did a comparative research that was in Tehran between 1983, 84 to 88, and then in Morocco. It was in Morocco that, uh, you know, Fatima Mernissi at that time was my hero. And that is, remember, that is long before her book, Islam, Woman and Islam came, you know, the second phase of uh, Fatima Mernissi. And there I met her and I was taken uh, under the protection of women's rights activists, feminists there, and it was in Morocco that I became feminist. But at the same time, the research that I was doing, what I was seeing in courts and how women, were really reclaiming their faith and how they were fighting for their rights through their faith really didn't sit very well from that kind of Islamic feminism. So when I, f I didn't touch any of this thing, I even didn't put myself on the book uh, when my first book came. But then I went back to Iran in 1992 after five years and I could see there is a new consciousness and Zanon magazine came out. And these were, uh, these were women who were Islamist in the beginning, in the 1980s, but by uh, a decade later, they became feminists, but they also kept their, kept their Islam, their faith. And I started uh, 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 studying them. So I became interested in Islamic feminism as a, as what my research was showing. And uh, it is interesting that in 1992, 1993, I wrote a number of articles trying to explain what is this new consciousness. None of them were published. All of them were rejected because they went to peer review and they thought that, you know, I don't understand feminism, neither I do understand Islam. So, that was in 1990s, uh, that was my journey. And, and the article that Mar um, uh, Margot is referring to is actually an article that I wrote uh, in 1990s, it published in 96, 1996, but it, is, it belongs to my, uh, um, my period there. So there was something happening and there was something that we are observing. But again, 1992 is important because a year before that, Fatima Mernis's Woman and Quran is available in English. And she takes a totally different position. And then Amina Vadud's book comes in 1992. And these were a really breakthrough. Uh, I did not uh, claim, you know, I think in 1980s, uh, 1990s, all my mm, struggle was to prove that I am not Islamist. I am not political Islam. I am feminist, but I am not political Islam. And I believe in feminism in Islam. And of course, that was a struggle. And when I was thinking about uh, this conversation, 
actually I realized that how much I spend in my energy in defending myself, in trying to say, what is this position? And when I did research in Qom, I didn't have the knowledge of Islam to that. But I, as an anthropologist, went and talked with the clerics because I wanted to understand, by that time I was interested in construction of gender in Islam. What, where does this family law come? So I talked with, um, uh, with the clerics in Iran, the custodians of um, Islamic law. And it was in the process of my fieldwork there that I started reading and I started listening to Abdul Karim Surush, to the new reform thinkers. And gradually I acquired the language. And that language was very important, but it's still at that time I didn't dare to tell them, to argue with them, because I was in Islamic Republic and a political context. Then at that time, I met Zaina Anwar. That was in 1999 in a uh, conference in Harvard. Uh, and I was also studying Sisters in Islam as a phenomenon, like Zanon and whatever in Egypt, there were new phases. And what happened that Zaina Anwar invited me to go to Malaysia to a, for a symposium on Islamic family law reforms. It was there that I met Amina Vadud and the Indone Indonesian scholars. And for the first time, I felt at home. I was in a meeting, I was in a conference, I didn't have to fight and defend my own position. I, I felt I was understood and I was learning. So that was really a turning point for me. And you know, when we talk about turning point, we know that about turning point almost years after that. At that time, I had no idea that it was the turning point. But I think I stopped fighting and I, and I really started uh, talking about fair, writing about fair. And Zaina asked me, Zaina Anwar, uh, at the time she was executive director of Sisters in Islam. Uh, she asked me to write a, an article. And that article, Construction of Gender in Islamic Legal Thought, that was the first time that I was writing for non-academic, non-anthropologists. So I had to take a position. And I had to explain things uh, away from academic anthropological uh, jargon. And I like that. And that was really liberating for me. And I think it was a time that I gradually uh, gained my voice. And also it was in 2003 that I met Margot. Margot, if you remember, we were invited in London for Qutsi um, Mirza invited you, me, and Hala Afshar for Islamic feminism, uh, feminism and Islamic law. And there was supposed a book was supposed to come, which never came. And, uh, and I, of course I knew Margot, you know, everybody knows Margot and her wonderful scholarship. But, you know, we just, we just were on the same side. And, so for me, it was really a good meeting, very confirming. And the rest of it is that, you know, creation of Musava and bringing all this. And for me, what was important is to bring knowledge, to produce feminist knowledge from within Islamic framework, because knowledge and power are so interconnected and it is not you know only me it is a, it is a collective voice that was there by then and uh, I remember the first year that I taught at NYU I taught a course on Islam and gender NYU law school I I had um, the material that I had on Islamic feminism was so limited that I devoted one third of the course but later on the last uh, year um, in 2017 19 that I taught it, it was all on Islamic feminism because there is no material, so there is no critical mass. And 
uh, we were part of it. And it is so nice to be part of that. Thank you, Ziba Jan, and thank you, Margot Jan. Um, it's a little awkward because I don't have a bio for me. I'm, I'm you know, a dude, the lady imam. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, I, um, I just, I, I want to see if I can articulate uh, what it was like for me in the 1990s and even at the beginning of uh, 2000 when I, really rejected the term feminism. Um, and there was no way for you to hyphenate it and, 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 and make it all right. Um, and that's actually because my experience as a black woman in the United States, let alone hijabi, uh, was clearly not taken into consideration in the mainstream voice of feminism. And of course, by the 1990s, when the rubric of discussion was happening to articulate you know this rise of political islam everything that wasn't the neo conservative patriarchal hegemonic binary version of islam was considered to be anti-islam and when you are muslim by choice you don't want to be in the anti-islam camp so in between my uh, feelings of displacement by the dominant, you know, white, middle-class, secular discourse about feminisms aggressively going on in certain places, um, you know, uh, at home in the United States, and my desire to be able to locate myself within uh, Islam, I decided that um, I was learning certain things from women's perspectives on certain issues, so I could at least say that I was pro-faith and pro-feminist. Um, and feminist could be a methodology. And, and yet I still did not advocate myself as feminist. Um, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, literally reading uh, Marco Badran's work about the different uh, waves of Muslim women's, uh, you know, uh, feminisms really helped me to kind of see that, okay, well, what I was rejecting had a, a time stamp on it. Um, and reading uh, Ziba's work on the construction of gender uh, helped me to see that I was actually talking about um, a, a classical framework that was problematic. And I had always been addressing that problematic framework with my work on the Quran, uh, but still I didn't, I didn't call it feminism. And so even as feminism in the West was expanding to um, challenge itself to be more actively intersectional, I still didn't jump on the bandwagon. I also didn't jump on the bandwagon for the term womanist uh, because it was so heavily laden by uh, Christology. Um, so black women looking for, um, you know, identity in the context of Christianity took the term womanist from Alice Walker, who herself is non-Christian. She's post-Christian, she's Buddhist. Um, and um, every time I would go to professional meetings like the American Academy of Religion, um, my life was divided. If I wanted to talk about something that had to do with, you know, say African-American identity, uh, there would be a session that would go simultaneously with if I wanted to talk about something that had to do with Islam, as well as if I wanted to talk about something that had to do with being a woman. Those three sessions were always being held simultaneously. And I thought it was very interesting. I thought it was very politically uh, indicative of the inability of us forging, you know, much more, I think, comprehensive kinds of collaborations. Uh, and I was, I spent a lot of time, you know, arguing about the dominant discourses over certain shared themes. Like, you know, one of my publications about Hajar is, you know, yeah, this is something that in the Abrahamic tradition, we all can claim some connection as Jews, Christians, and Muslims, but it's still the Jewish Christian a version of it that gets to dominate the discussion. So I was always pushing back at the ways in which I was pushed out. Becoming an Islamic feminist and accepting it and then looking retrospectively at, you know, my life and my, you know, my work was a process 
and um, it was pretty much characterized by me wearing a t-shirt uh, when I was uh, at the Musawa meeting that had feminists on it. And I had collected this t-shirt when I was at the Iwid a, 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 um, Association of Women in Development meeting in um, South Africa, because for the first time, I actually felt like there were enough women and they were across the age spectrum and they were also across different localities. There were enough women who knew how to affirm their own uh, dignity that I didn't have to defend people because some dominant voice was trying to, you know, marginalize. And uh, I, I, you know, I happened to see this t-shirt. It was one of the freebies that they gave away, you know, and I thought, well, I'm, I'm about ready to wear this. And I wore it first uh, at a meeting uh, in uh, Kuala Lumpur at the launching of Musawa. Uh, and the reason why I came to that was it wasn't just that the term feminism needed to be interrogated for its purview. It was also that the term Islam and Islamic needed to be interrogated for its patriarchal dominance. And for so long, you know, I was one of those people who were trying to find the perfect Islam, the true Islam. I actually believed that there was only one and that everything else was deviant. And uh, therefore, if I wanted to be in this Islam, then I had to go along with it, even as I was struggling with it, you know, uh, you know, all the way through. When I finally realized I didn't have to go with the neoconservative, patriarchal, hegemonic, binary articulations of Islam, uh, it was possible for me then to relax my hold over my, you know, uh, skepticism with regard to the term feminism. So I say these days, I can't be Muslim without my feminism and I can't be feminist without my Islam. But the thing is that it is my feminism and it is my Islam. I didn't get here by myself. I got here because, um, you know, one of the sexiest things I think in life is intelligence. And Ziba and Margot always brought forth very well thought out arguments and they also continue to develop their own thinking along the way. So where it might have been at one point was simply an introduction into a conversation that had scarcely any footprints in the snow. So when we look back now and we see the playground is just full of footprints, um, that wasn't the way that it was. We were making a way where there was no way, you know, um, and um, the, the place where we were able to come together was after, you know, what Ziba used the term, uh, you know, sort of the, the critical mass. After there was enough conversations going on about it, it was, it was easier to figure out what were the things that had caused the rifts in the past and what were the ways to resolve it. Now, there are obviously still some voices out there who don't want that resolution. And so I'm not going to try to pretend that we're all standing around singing Kumbaya. But the thing that I find interesting is that uh, when the arguments were simply between the Islamists or political Islam and between the secularists in the anti-religion version of it, when those were the two dominant voices, there was no way for them to come together because they were both in agreement that you can't have both Islam and feminism. And uh, to, to, to uh, unlock that grid took not just interrogation of feminism and how it's understood, but it also took interrogation of Islam and who has control over how we even define someone as within Islam. So these days, I, I'm, I'm constantly saying on social media, no, I'm not that kind of Muslim. No, I don't want that kind of Islam. I am, it, but it, it took some time to be comfortable enough with Islam within myself before I could give up the desire to be a part of, you know, whatever was the dominant group. Um, and I think it's the scholarship uh, that made a difference because I didn't have 
I didn't have what you would call a live reality. There's no personal status law in the United States. So I wasn't up against, uh, you know, state sanctioned implementation of Islam as in Egypt, as in Iran. I wasn't up against, a, you know, a state sanctioned articulation of, uh, you know, Islam and what it means to be a Muslim woman. I was only up against various cultures um, and at the same time, um, I had the, uh, you know, sort of the baraka, really the benefit of this journey through the Quran for me, which always led me to believe that there is more to this Islam than what is being promoted within the context of various cultures. Um, and that the cultures are help, are something that help with the expressions of it, but it's not the sum total of it. Um, and when I gave up the idea that Islam uh, has to be one set thing, then it was possible for me to bring the two things together in terms of Islamic feminism. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so Ziba and Margo, do you have a comments that you want to make to each other before we open up to the gallery? Um, hello? Yeah. Uh, actually, I had so many notes and I threw them out because you terrified me <laughs> about time. But uh, the lived reality for me was a big trigger. And I was living in Egypt and I still live in Egypt. And I since have become a citizen uh, some time ago. But even before I was a citizen, I was living under Muslim personal law. And it didn't suit me one bit. And the other thing I was living under, the do's and the don'ts. You know, so my lived experience in combination with studying the history pushed me very far. And I have to say that people like um, Seiza Nabarawi, for example, who was the uh, close companion of, of Hodi Sharawi, she encouraged me and she made me feel comfortable in having a voice and taking a stand against these what I thought were ridiculous forms of oppression or whatever it was or control. She herself was not an Islamic feminist by any means. She was she didn't know much about Islam because she was raised in the critical years in France and so on. But um, uh, but for me unlike you, I mean, we're both Americans, okay, but so here, here in the States, I didn't, I mean, Akhwa Shaksia, there was no Akhwa Shaksia, so suddenly I get married, I have four, I got married in a mosque, I got married in, in a church, and, and under both jurisdictions, I, it's been registered in the U.S. And, and Egypt, so suddenly I get over there, and all this is on my head, you see, so that was very, very important for me, and the idea of keeping my mouth open and my eyes open and when I went to Azhar it was a very positive experience. The sheikh that taught me was ready to have any kind of conversation, was open to things and even defended me in certain areas when other sheikhs were sort of a little bit uncomfortable. So all of this was part of my story of Islamic feminism. It's located in you know two major different cultures and then more globally. So that's what I wanted. You triggered that off, so I wanted to add that. Yeah. Ziba Jan? Yes, I want to add something to that. When I, when I started my research on construction of gender and went to Qom, uh, at that time, you know, by the time that as I was doing my research, I realized that when we say Islam, who is Islam? What interpretation of Islam? So as an anthropologist, I really was interested to understand what is this Islam that everybody is talking about. And that is at the level of text, interpretation of text, who has the right to talk about Islam? That was one thing. And then there was the level of the national discourses and um, laws. And it was in that level of the national discourses that we had Islamic feminism was contradiction in terms because those who were feminists could not accept that Islam be feminist. 
And of course, for the interpretation of the text with the, all these guys whom uh, Olama that I'm talking uh, with, you know, they wanted to talk to me in order to understand what is the feminist critique of Islam in order to provide a response. And therefore, that was it. But at the level of lived reality, when I was doing field work, I could see that all my certainties, all my, uh, so many things that I took for granted was challenged. So what I'm trying to say that there were changes at three levels, at the level of text, at the level of understanding of the text and interpretation. It is the time that your book, I mean, Abadud, your book comes out. Fatima Mernisi, and we get a new genre of uh, literature that did not exist. And that happened in 1990s. And to my knowledge, in 1980s, the only book or the only person who wrote about this was um, a book of Islam and uh, a Muslim woman. And there was an article there, but it was not from a feminist position. You know, it was not that. And at the lived reality, I think for me, the change happened when I went to Malaysia, because without a group, without a support, if you are a lone voice, you cannot claim that identity. And uh, for Marwa, um, I keep on saying Marwa, for uh, Margo, uh, Islamic feminism was a knowledge that she was sharing and she was participating. For me, it was also an identity as well as a source of legitimacy. I wanted to shape that feminism. I wanted to shape what Islam is. And at the same time, I wanted to shape what feminism is. And to do that, I, I wanted to take a position. So when I look at my own writing in 1990s, a lot of, uh, uh, in 2000, a lot of it is uh, the, about who's Islam, who's feminism, and arguing that they are contested concept. And then uh, uh, another level uh, the, is that there is possible to have an egalitarian interpretation and to bring it about. So um, I, I see identity is important and legitimacy important because when we talk about Islam or any branch of knowledge, we are dealing with power. And you cannot fight power only by knowledge. You need to fight power by power as well. And we need a movement. We need something. We need a consciousness for women to claim their voices. And I think that was one thing that Margot and I had our differences in 19... Uh, not in 1990s, I think around the 2000s. But uh, I, uh, for me, that differences are now gone because I'm no longer in that defensive position that want to, uh, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable and, I'm, uh, and I think the Islamic feminism that I'm talking about is about inclusivity. And without inclusivity, it cannot be feminism. And without, um, inclusivity and plurality for me it cannot be Islam. So again, I go back to who is Islam, what Islam, who is feminism. Okay, we're going to open up to the gallery. Um, first, uh, Amanda, if there is uh, someone who uh, has a good question that um, you can share that they don't want to share themselves or a good question that uh, the person is willing to come on and articulate it uh, themselves uh, just kind of let me know and we'll we'll start with that and we just have one question in the chat um from musaru and i think they are still here okay hello yes i'm still here great okay uh, okay, first of all, hi everybody. So many of my super women together on one screen. It's amazing. Um, my question is this, that how have you guys navigated and addressed the phenomenon of patriarchal white feminism 
and the lack of intersectionality with faith. I'm currently in my second year of my PhD at a British university, and my research is a spin-off of the project, the Global Lives Project, Lived Realities Project that, that Mia Ziba alluded to. Um, but I'm finding it very difficult at university. Um, my position sometimes becomes very difficult because what I'm finding is that people not only are unaccepting, uh, they really just don't want to know. They are, they're not interested in my feminism. Uh, they're not interested in that plurality. They're not interested in any other form of feminism other than their white middle class, white savior feminism. Um, to the point where really I'm thinking the sooner I get this done and leave the better. So I'd just like your, your views on that please and maybe some tips and practical guidance. Can I say something Ziba? Uh, the way that I navigated this which was not, in fact, uh, that was the, what I was really facing in 1990s. And it is one reason that I went freelance and started mm -hmm. to work as an independent researcher. Because I did not fit in the Islamic studies. I was not seen as having the knowledge. And mm -hmm. I even was not seen as having the brain to get that knowledge. So that is, you know, not having that capacity to get that knowledge. And I was not, also did not fit in women's studies and feminism because I was talking about faith, Islam. And for the Western feminism, feminists, and I think for the Western world, Islam is the projections of what they see as all evils in religion. Yeah. In their own religion, okay? But they project it to Islam. And uh, uh, what I uh, did, because by that time, luckily I had my PhD a long time before that. In fact, I moved into uh, gender studying women uh, and Islam in 1984, four years after I got my PhD. And so I became freelance and I started to put, do my research because I was so passionate and I was just lucky, you know, to be able to live by it. And uh, things started for me to change after the, the film that I made with Kim Longinato King, Divorce Iranian Style. Mm. It was after that film that all these Iranian feminists, because who were so me uh, as an Islamist, as an apologist, suddenly changed their view and they didn't change their view because you know i was saying something different because of the power of the picture and because they could hear the women's voices and also things were changing and what i want uh, i'm trying to say that if you want to stay in academia that is a game that whether you want to play it or not but as a phd student put all your energy in order to get your PhD, then you have the legitimacy to enter in an academic discussion. Okay. Uh, I, I would say don't waste your energy. <laughs> I did it for 10 years. Mm. Um, actually, this white feminism in America, um, I just, uh, First of all, it's a very large term, okay? And there are pockets and pieces that are not, I mean, that are different, okay? I just walked away from what I didn't agree with. I wasn't going to waste my time arguing with these people. I had already lived in Egypt for quite some time. I had been in Oxford, etc. I didn't need to be bogged down with their ignorance and their problems. So I just walked away from it. But among these folks were feminists who were more open to pluralism and uh, different ideas and, and so on. And there was a group that had formed in the 70s called the Institute for Research and History in New York. 
and it was a group of independent women scholars who were trained as historians and who didn't find places in the academy to do work on women and gender and feminism and so on. And this was a very pluralistic group of mostly white American feminists in which I felt comfortable with all these other folks. I don't need to be bogged down by them. I don't need to answer them and they don't need to organize my life for me. That was my experience. Thank you. Okay, uh, other questions, please? Yeah, there's a, a question here I think that's relevant to this conversation from Mulk and um, they've asked to, to ask it. So go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Okay, hello everybody. Actually, it says Mulk, but it's actually Mulki. I have no idea how it was Mulk. There's an I at the end. <laughs> I don't know who signed me up. So I'm really happy to be in this uh, company. I'm really happy to listen to all your presentations and reflections. I, I've read all your work, learned so much from all three of you. Um, and I also get to work in closely with uh, Ziba and uh, Amina. So my question is, and it's uh, if perhaps all three of you can uh, reflect on it, is, is um, um, I see Islamic feminism, studying it as both, and I think all three of you have touched on that as, as a knowledge, as, as building knowledge, but it's also, um, it's, it's, uh, it's about uh, uh, transforming, changing things on, on the ground. It's, it's, it's a, a striving to be a movement or a movement. It's, it's, trans, it's a knowledge that wants to change things. So do you see a tension between Islamic feminism uh, as a knowledge building, as a scholarship, um, and as an activist project and to clarify where, I, where I'm going with this a little bit is I want to go back to some of the things that Badra Amargo said about inclusivity uh, and Ziba what she shared with us about the tensions and, and Wadud Amina also so for example if it's knowledge uh, and it's within Islam, then it means we need to engage with the textual tradition, we need to look at the methodologies, we need to critique that, build on it, draw on it, and if it's Islamic, in what way is it situated within that tradition while at the same time critiquing it? And also, does that require also a faith-based position as, as well as expertise? Uh, while at, Whereas on the activist side, it's it's about including different kinds of people who uh, advocate for gender equality, even if they are not partaking in that part of the knowledge or don't necessarily see that it needs to be grounded in Islam. Um, so what is Islamic about it? And do you see tension between those two parts of Islamic feminism? Thank you. Ladies. Yeah, that, uh, Mulki, thank you. That's a very important question because, and I, and I don't think that there is one simple answer for that question, like all important questions. Uh, you say you uh, see Islamic feminism as a transformative uh, um, project on the ground. That is the nature of feminism. All feminism is transformative. Because uh, feminism, you know, has the movement and also consciousness and knowledge building. And these three parts always come together. And, you know, there is a division of labor, uh, who does what and to what extent and what um, uh, level. So on that one, yes, I agree with you that it is, it's, if it is not transformative, it is not Islamic. Uh, it is not feminist. But I also to see uh, religion as a, a transformative consciousness. Because, you know, once you have this faith and religion, it gives you a different path, a different tools in order to transform yourself. You know, when I look at the early the Islam, you know, what the prophet did uh, was transforming individuals so they can transform the society. So that part is also important. And uh, what uh, is matters here is the question of legitimacy. If you want to have legitimacy, if you want your voice to be heard, 
by the same people who share your faith, uh, you, uh, it makes a difference uh, as a terms of movement. I wouldn't say in terms of knowledge. In terms of knowledge, it would make no difference. But of course, if you are um, a believer, then you have a different um, urgency for knowledge. But again, you know, knowledge is knowledge at uh, one level without the position. So I don't see it with, uh, in, in, um, in uh, contradiction with inclusivity. It is just about doing different things and division of labor among people and following a path. That's how I see it. Uh, I just want to uh, bring up a little thing, that, uh, something that happened in the fall of 2011 in Egypt, where in the first year of the revolution, things are very fiery. Uh, young Egyptians, I suppose most of them were Muslim, but you know, you don't always know who's a Christian and a Muslim necessarily, right? Um, invited me or asked me to talk on Islamic feminism in the context of revolution. And we met in a very informal cafe type of uh, environment in Munira, in a, a, a part of Cairo. And we talked about social justice and equality and uh, dignity and all these themes that were part of the revolution. And the question of tools or inspiration. I mean, what does Islam, how can we use Islamic feminism uh, and the question of gender justice and national justice and all these sorts of things. And nobody seemed, I didn't get the impression that they were looking at me and saying, is she a Muslim or is she not a Muslim or does she have legitimacy? I had arguments, I had things to say. They invited me to say it and I thought, the context was, we are Egyptians, we know different things, we may be Muslims, we may be Christians, we may be converts, we may be naturalized Egyptians, all this stuff. But when it really, it, the fires are up and the revolution is on, you huddle together, not just in the square, but you bring all your, what you know, to the table. And nobody, you know, if I had something to bring to the table, other people had something to bring to the table, and we discussed and then we had another meeting and then it phased out because things got very messy and it was very difficult. But I thought it was a very good example of how the knowledge is not necessarily attached to a formal position, a, a identity position. It was attached to, a, in this sense, an Egyptian identity, but not a religious one. So that's all. Uh, I just want to add, um, I like uh, listening to, uh, you know, uh, Ziba and Marco as a reminder of the process uh, where we have had to grapple with our locations in individual silos to being able to come to a place where we can cooperate and collaborate uh, towards certain goals. Um, and at the same time remain distinct. Um, and um, I, think, uh, I think that uh, when we were trying to chisel out a place that began to be called Islamic feminism, we did have to uh, grapple with the parameters and to determine what's in it and what's out of it. Um, but now it has, it has grown to the point of overflow. Um, I, for example, like to make a distinction between Muslim feminist and Islamic feminist because where everyone who is Muslim, um, I'm sorry, everyone who is an Islamic feminist uh, might claim an identity as Muslims or not, um, not every Muslim feminist is necessarily using Islamic methodologies in my mind, um, they're either borrowing from the knowledge building uh, work done in methodology and the like with Islamic feminists who are interrogating you know, paradigms and helping to make paradigm shifts, but they also uh, use um, you know, liberal feminist arguments uh, in, in their identity. Um, and, I, and, and I used to have a problem with that until I realized that I can't be both Muslim uh, 
you know, and uh, Islamic feminists. So I better figure out what it means to be a Muslim feminist and not be so antagonistic about it. Um, but it, it was it was in the phase where there was so much tension between you know any identification as feminist and any identification as Muslim. Uh, it was it was in that phase that I wanted to have a place for me that would allow me to uh, express uh, the, the, the particular contributions that I was able to make, which, which really wasn't about lived reality in the collective sense, um, unless I was in cooperation with particular women working in particular regions for uh, that component of the effects of Islamic feminism. In other words, it has an effect on policy. It has an effect on culture. It has an effect on your consciousness and your awareness, you know, um, and, and yet I can't have that effect. I can't have an effect on, I live in Indonesia. Um, I can't have an effect when I lived in Malaysia. I can't have an effect um, if I am limited to having an effect by being a member of that place. So um, in the end, my contribution is within that umbrella thing, that, that uh, flowing nebulous, uh, as I said, used to be defined as the true. And now I find that uh, looking for the true is just a form of arrogance because everybody who does it leaves out somebody. Um, so I no longer feel that I need to uh, batten down the hatchets of Islam uh, or the hatchets of feminism and rather to keep them fluid and to keep the discourse um, with, a, with a little bit of tension. Why not? Because the tension uh, makes us think. Uh, and uh, so I think, I think in the beginning, um, I was so careful about I am not this and I am not that, that you know, my identity is this and my identity is not that. Um, and my work cannot be that either. I, I was so self-protective, um, but it, it didn't work. And, and maybe I should just say that it didn't work. It's like Audre Lorde saying, your silence is not gonna protect you. I always thought if I could just show the methodology that I had used for my work and how coherently it was located within uh, the trajectory of uh, Islamic knowledge production that everybody would accept it. And I'm over that illusion. Um, so I think, um, I, I think we have moved uh, from where we were 30 years ago, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. And I definitely see that we need to keep moving. And uh, just coincidentally, the sequel to this is going to be an intersectional Islamic feminist uh, live stream uh, with uh, representation, mostly from the next generation, uh, about uh, the ways in which we still have challenges that we need to address in terms of how we promote um, you know, our understanding of Islamic feminism with uh, the contingencies of a, an increasingly complex uh, and diverse uh, lived reality. Next question. So there's a, um, a question um, that, I'll, that I'll ask and then I know Hoda would like to um, share a comment. The, the question that I think relates a little bit to what you were just talking about comes from Mustaq Firo. I'm saying that right. And um, they wonder um, about how you see the progress of Islamic feminism today, especially in its relation with the growing Islamic conservatism. And the question was to um, both of both uh, Professor Margo and Professor Ziba. Um uh you know what uh what uh, denise candioti is calling the uh, patriarchal restoration um uh well i i feel um less daunted in a way than i did when 
<clears throat> political Islam was kind of surging up because we didn't have all the tools, all the knowledge, all the experience, and so on. And now I think those folks are in bad shape and we are very strong. Now, uh, you know, we've been in lockdown, many of us, I mean, most of us, you know, for so long that I'm, I'm feeling out of context, you know, I mean, and, and I'm not either in America or in Egypt, I'm somehow just locked up. Um, so it's hard to know how to deal with these folks because we're all kind of frozen at the moment. But I think they're very much an endangered species and they know it. And I think it's the last gasp. And um, when I'm out of this, you know, kind of cocoon, um, you know, I, I mean, I and others, we have the tools, we have the energy and these folks are not making much sense. I think even there's a broader cultural, a broader cultural understanding. So I think this new uh, conservatism is, um, is, uh, you know, uh, not in good shape and uh, will will not sort of get very far. That's my idea. Mm. Uh, yes, I, I agree. I agree with Margot. In 1990s and early 20s, whenever I wrote about Islamic feminism, I resisted the definition. And I said, it's a movement in, for, uh, in shaping. It is being formed. And to understand the movement that is emerging and shaping, the best is to understand who are, uh, what discourses they are arguing against. Because we always define ourselves a new movement or new discourse, it comes, it is in response to another discourse. And it was to me obvious, it was political Islam that really had a political agenda and wanted to impose patriarchy in the name of Islam. And also the traditionalists, we just accepted every, uh, the old interpretation without questioning it. And the sec third group, uh, group was secular feminists that really could not see that uh, religion and uh, especially Islam and feminism can go together. But like Margot, I, I now that we are talking in 2020, I think there has been a lot of those who were in political Islam are now in close to us, no longer are opposing us because political Islam has failed. And what really uh, gave political Islam its power was claiming that they bring justice in the name of Sharia. But they brought just war, injustice, and everything. So they have lost their legitimacy. And the traditionalists will always be traditionalists. And the secular feminists, I think, especially after 9-11, they came to realize that in the name of secularism and human rights, you can do atrocities as happened after 9-11. So both the Islamic, uh, the um, secular feminists and human rights activists had to come from their high ground. And the genuine political uh, uh, Muslim uh, uh, Islamists, they also had to realize the failure of the project of Islamic State. And I feel we are now all in the same boat. The, the boat is the progressive forces, those who are arguing for justice and equality and the extreme rightist forces, whether they are in the West or they are in the East or within uh, communities. So there is, there is a kind of realism. There is a sense of, um, there is a sense of, uh, it's a different uh, context. And I, I also think a lot depends on what we do. You know, uh, uh, the, the, what we do, you know, I, I at least for myself, I think I'm getting too old and too tired. So there is a new generation coming and they don't have our baggage and they have so many tools that my generation didn't have. So I am optimistic. And as an activist as well, I cannot, lose my optimism. I want to hang on to it. And also as a person of faith, because without hope, 
one wouldn't take any action. Okay, next question. Uh, I think Huda, did you have a comment? Yes, um, so I'm just going to close the door because my. Um, thank you all so much. I think, I mean, I won't take time saying how amazing this discussion has been and timely, but I think what I've noticed um, in terms of the themes that are emerging out of every speaker and even the questions and the latest anonymous questions have been is that there is um, uh, this, I think, what makes Islamic feminism so unique, um, or Muslim feminism, I'm not sure which one. Uh, is our uh, personal experiences of Islam and womanness or, or womanhood. Each of us has had uh, a personal experience that has led to a form of seeking um, for the truth, for justice, for what is equal. And I was just reflecting on my own experience. So uh, uh, I think some of you talked about how um, being uh, asking who's Islam and who's feminism uh, and I had a very acute sense of that from a very early age from the age of two because I, I, was, I am a, I'm a Shia Muslim living in a Sunni majority Islamic world and um, uh, uh, particularly for, for the time that I was born under Saddam Hussein being a Shia Muslim was lethal so I had to very early on to understand that actually the Islam that I see or have heard about, because we had to move continuously to avoid being killed, um, was not my Islam, it was somebody else's. And then when I came to, um, to so being a minority within Islam gave you that acute sense of knowing that you don't belong in the majority. Um, and then, and it was unsafe to say that I am different. And, and so therefore, when, when, when you um, have questions about, well, um, when I was asking my own Shia interpretation of Islam questions, it was even more lethal because to be in a minority and asking questions within the minority was really dangerous because you are rudderless, you know, there's, no, there's no nothing. And to be asking these questions in a Western context is even more dangerous. Um, uh, and so I think, so what it dawned on me is like, um, how um, dangerous and brave and courageous it is to claim Islam and feminism, and how like utterly kind of, um, Sort of subversive it is to to say out loud or even internally actually i i don't belong to or, or i have a different point of view um, and so my feminism started when i started asking allah the question uh, uh through the quran it's like well why why that why are you saying that word and not that word and why did you choose this you know description and not that description um, and so i i guess i think what i also reflected is Collectively, although I mean, you've talked about silos in our experiences, just the power of um, our lived reality in causing these seismic shifts. Because if Ziba and Margot and you did not make these, did not ask these questions purely informed on your personal experiences, we would not be here today. And I think that's really transformative. And I think that's what Musawa has done in terms of its like personal stories project of women across the globe is to say how has your experience of being a woman in a Muslim context uh, uh, can be shared because it collectively it creates seismic shifts that enable us to have these discussions um, and then I started thinking about and that and I think that's what the Quran teaches us and I think we firmly are, are choosing to place ourselves in that context because the Quran talks about the personal realities and the lived realities of the messengers or the stories within the Quran that cause these, these societal shifts, essentially. Um, and I think one of the things that I found really interesting is the idea of Ziba's legitimacy. And I think so, this is the heart of the questions that we keep asking in the gallery is like, do I have the legitimacy to ask these questions? And do, uh, and you quite rightly talk about power. Uh, and I think that's, that's the heart of um, 
the essence of the courageousness of the Islamic feminist project is to say I have the right to ask based on purely my lived reality as a creature of Allah, not because I'm a scholar of Islam, not because I'm an academic, not because of anything. I'm just purely a sentient being from the Almighty that knows intimately without words that I, I am worthy because I was created and therefore I need to ask. And that's, for me, is a form of worship. And so maybe Islamic feminism or feminism, I liken it to a well where we each come to it from our own different paths. We are nourished by it, but we go away and do so many different things that are totally connected in this um, kind of solar ecosystem that has ramifications beyond our silos. And so I don't, um, so perhaps maybe we just need to accept that um, feminism and Islamic feminism and is evolving thing that we can't really define but the power of our personal experience is at the heart of what makes it so transformative for me. and I am so grateful that you acted on your personal lived reality because I would not be like here if it wasn't for you and all of the women in the gallery so thank you yeah one of the things that um, I'm hoping to do whenever the you know the COVID uh, scenario settles itself out and I do get to take up the opportunity to teach again that um, was worked out before it hits and now it's going to be deferred um, is to um, really iron out this thing about live realities as methodology. Um, Sadia Sheikh has a really nice uh, article on it um, um, and, and yet um, I think, uh, Huda, you're, you're giving the example, I was taking notes as a matter of fact, thank you. You're giving uh, the reminder that in the Quran, there are all these personal narratives of the prophets. There's a few other stories, uh, including stories of women, uh, you know, that are there as well. Um, that uh, having those stories uh, set um, the stage uh, in, in terms of the Quranic guidance, the story set the stage for understanding how the guidance is supposed to work in application to real people. Uh, it is my opinion, and it's very easy to verify this opinion, that um, in the course of the production of the foundational knowledge of Islam that we refer to as classical, uh, that uh, the lived realities of the men who had better opportunities to become scholars and to make contributions um, impacted what they did, and yet it was not called that. And because it was not called that, they could pretend that it was objective. It was purely rational. Um, and actually, that's a lie. Uh, it was always embedded knowledge, and the knowledge was always embedded in their own situations. Uh, but, of course, it was open for discussion and debate because the doors were not yet closed so tightly over the question of legitimacy. And when the question of legitimacy gets indispersed with notions of authority, uh, once again, uh, it allows for some kind of elitism and for other people to be kept out of it. So, you know, my thing is, you know, I've been working on what I call democratization of authority. Um, and I uh, remember how uh, Khaled Abu Fadl in his book, Speaking in the Name of God, uh, the Authoritative and Authority in Islam, uh, how he, he says that, uh, you know, uh, authority is something that has the potential to shape, this is not a quotation, this is a paraphrase, to shape uh, the uh, discussion in the context of, you know, Muslim community, but also has the potential to transform the community. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm doing this thing, you know, about being the lady imam, which, you know, for half my 25 years that I now refer to, I actually shied away from it for fear of it sounding too much like I was trying to be a leader 
which I was not. But after a while, it becomes very clear that you can't really talk about the different aspects of women's empowerment in the context of the mosque and in terms of uh, ritual uh, devotions. You can't talk about it without talking about the, the, some of the lived realities of my own experiences as the lady imam. So in a way, become a marker for the community's transformation. I find that really fascinating because I didn't ask for it, but then you look back, as we look back on, you know, you know, not just the 30 years, because all of us had experiences before we got to that 30 year where the discussion about Islamic feminism started. But when you start to look back, you start to realize there, there are all these uh, shifts that were going uh, and they were impacted by, you know, history unfolding around us and participating in that history. Uh, and also we were having an impact on it. Um, so I think that um, for the future, well, first of all, I mean, I still, I still have that you sort of abstract thinking, you know, kind of hat. And I really want to, to grapple with, uh, you know, the ways of understanding what is this methodology of lived reality to, to bring it out from making it sound like it's just your personal narrative. It's not just your personal narrative. It is about how your narrative is shaping the continual expansion of the community's definition of itself. Uh, one of the things that I do when I'm working with the uh, LBGTQI Muslims is I just say, keep telling your story because 10 years from now when people look back they need to have some breadcrumbs to follow so they don't think oh this is the first time that we ever even hear of such a thing as queer and muslim you know so i i i i think getting a handle on uh, the fact that everyone is is situated that the scholars of the past were also situated and the extent to which, for example, male scholars were situated in the privilege of being able to have their discussions be considered as authority means that we need to participate in creating new notions of authority by the act of doing it. Uh, so no, you don't have to uh, have mastery over you know, th this many languages and this many texts uh, in order uh, to be able to help shape that new reality. That's not what we, 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 we live anymore. Um, and when people come to the point where they, they can understand how important it is from the perspective of the necessity of diversity for the longevity of Islam, then there will not be this tendency to say, well, uh, you know, because often I see people come forward and they say, well, I'm not a scholar, you know, it's like, it's not about you being a scholar, even though I, I put a lot of time into being a scholar myself. It's not about, you know, being a scholar. It's about a narrative that helps to shift the continual narrations of what is Islam. And everybody has something that they can contribute. And when we look back retrospectively, you know, historically, we look back 50 years from now, and somebody watches this, you know, old YouTube video that came from the, uh, you know, from the, you know, uh, imagination of somebody, uh, we want to be able to say, we embraced wholeheartedly that Islam belongs to the people who want it and other people who feel that Islam only belongs to their exclusive little club can go off in their club and have it and we can continue the rest of us to keep shaping Islam, expanding its, its parameters until it is truly universal and taking, you know, taking place uh, in many fronts. That's what I think. Yes, Ibadan. Yes, uh, thank you, Hoda, for this amazing sharing and also Amina for theorizing it. In fact, that is when the idea of Nomusawa came, it was exactly because of this. Because there were a group of women who claimed authority. You know, authority, you got to, uh, what feminism, when we look at the early feminist groups, 
they claimed authority. Nobody gave them authority. They claimed it. So authority is something to claim. And um, the legitimacy as a Muslim, you, one always has the legitimacy. So what we really we wanted to do in Musawa is the very idea that you say that um, it's like a well, Islamic feminism, that you go and contribute. We had, or at least I had this um, metaphor as a table with delicious food. And people can come and choose or different ingredients to make a new recipe. You make something new. And what was important for us was that women should be part of the production of knowledge because women's voices were silent. You see, you hear women's voices protesting, demanding in the Quran. But after the death of the Prophet, gradually they were marginalized. By the time that fair schools emerged, there was no trace of them in the, in the knowledge there, in, in the knowledge, uh, recorded knowledge. So it is actually, we need to create new knowledge inscribing women's voices there and also democratization of knowledge. And that is, that was the basis of the idea of Musawa. And to do this, you have to bring movement, activism with knowledge together. Because knowledge on its own is not going to change. And that is why, you know, I'm so much wedded to the idea of feminism, because feminism is for change. And, and it was also feminism that gave, gave us the tools of asking new questions. And you ask this new question because I think because as women, we, we felt in, inequality and injustice from the very beginning. And it is in our nature to react to that. Uh, but I, I, am, uh, I want to say that I'm optimistic about it because we are now in 21st century and uh, it's possible, it's possible to do things that was not even possible in the 20th century. Uh, jump in. The, the importance of um, uh, narrating uh, one's own experience oral hist and or oral history taking uh, has been um, very well uh, discussed by both of you. Um, I just wanted to point out, I mean, this question, um, Amina, of the breadcrumbs and so on. When I first, I mean, here comes age, but I first got to Egypt in the seven, 60s, and I started in the late 60s, early 70s, doing research on the first wave of, femini first wave of feminism in Egypt. And if you look in the bibliography, there's a long, long list of um, interview, I call them interviews, but it was lots of different shapes, you know, telling their stories and so on. And so that book was very much built up um, in terms of the experience, uh, self-articulated by the women. And without that, we don't have the fine tuning and the, uh, you know, the, all the nuancing. So it's very, very important to keep recording our experiences and helping other people record them and taking uh, and keeping these records. Just wanted to add that. Okay, we have 15 minutes before we hit the two hour mark. And um, I think we might be able to do one or two more questions um, just to kind of, uh, you know, sort of pace us. Because um, last time I kind of like went to the end and said, okay, we got to stop. So um, please. Okay, so um, let's, oh, uh, Samia had a, a, a question. Hi, salam alaikum. I am just so honored to be in this uh, group. Um, and uh, I, it's, it's very interesting because what I was feeling, um, Huda really articulated very much exactly what I was trying to think of. And it just, um, it just brought to mind um, uh, how I took a, you know, a Muslim woman studies class in 1981 at the University of Washington. And all the books that we read and everything, well, there was, I think, uh, Mernesi, there was uh, her book, but not anyone that was a Muslim speaking about the Muslim woman's um, experience or about Islamic 
Islamic feminism. And I just remember when I read, and I think it must have been very, very shortly after it was published, when I read Amina's Quran in Woman. And um, I was always, had always been a faithful, always been a believer, and obviously always been a feminist, and always thought anything that, you know, I just couldn't come to terms with was just a, a matter of not completely understanding or finding that truth that, that had to be there. And I just remember that Quran and Woman was, I'm not a scholar, I, you know, I don't speak Arabic or, or read Arabic, but being able to read Quran and Woman in a digestible, <laughs> um, short, to the point, um, it was absolutely life-changing. So much so that I just felt like, actually felt this personal connection to Amina for the next 20 years and didn't actually get to meet her until... Uh, I don't know, what was it, three or four years ago in person in Eugene, Oregon. And I just remember feeling like, oh my God, this is just like giving birth. It's like I've been pregnant with this. And I guess what I want to say too is that how do, I know, I realize I love Musawa and what, you know, what's offered there, but how do we reach so many of these men and women muslims that that are thirsty for this and they really have not been able to get past it's like they just need this little nudge or this little pr <laughs> that that you are allowed to come and drink from this well and that there is this well and we have these authorities who are the people that we can turn to if you definitely need to. And, well, we always need somebody who's a scholar and an authority, but why, how, what is there? I just feel like there's this, this small little break that we're waiting for to make this more accessible and not, not saying that this group, but I mean, that we as the Muslims that are drinking from the well and that are, you know, getting our, our thirst, you know, quenched, um, but want to share this with, with, with others that you don't have to be a scholar to benefit from the scholarly works that everyone has done, that you do have the right to live your Islam and have your interpretation. And I mean, I, I see, for example, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I look at people like, you know, Yasmin Mugahid or, or whatever. I mean, I don't think they're actual scholars but somehow they've taken on these roles as women, and I think they might even describe themselves as feminists, but they've somehow taken on these popular roles that further the patriarchal gatekeeper view that number one, there's, you can, we, you know, the way Islam is, is perfectly egalitarian and I don't have to be like a man. Um, on one hand, and so this is my apologist explanation for why you do have to live a lesser life. And two, why are they given the authority, you know, that that you have can only take your knowledge from scholars, and then why aren't our scholars respected, our scholars that have done all of that legwork? And I guess I'm not answering, asking for actual questions, but I'm just like, it's, I'm at a loss that here we are, you know, I mean, uh, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, where we had, you know, a very, very small Muslim community. And here, 40 years later, they're building walls for us to pray behind and not allowing women to be on their board of, boards of directors of mosques. And it's just how I know there's so many people out there that are so thirsty. And anyway, it's more of an observation, I guess, than a question. And really, Huda and Amina, you know, you really did, all of you spoke to that, this this need to democratize, um, at dem democratize and give authority to our, to our scholars who have done it in the very manner that is respected and considered the way that that you become an authority on an Islamic subject. So thank you. <laughs> and if you have 
comments on it or other brainstorm yeah, I'm interested to hear. I do want to, to comment hear. on that because I had written some notes and I didn't quite know how I was going to present it. So I have already uh, recycled my uh, notes. Um, and that is, um, uh, at this time in history, uh, when people do not, especially, especially when they claim leadership within the context of Muslim communities, as scholars, as imams, as you know, community leaders in other ways. Um, at this time in history, when they pretend um, that there's no such thing as Islamic feminism, um, um, it is actually beyond just ignorance. It's moved on to the level of jahiliya. Because jahiliya is not just, I don't know, Okay, so I can say, for example, I don't know a lot about um, economics, but I'm trying to figure out what's going on, you know, with the, the COVID-19 and I need some economics, right? Um, it's okay not to know something, you know, you can then find out about it. Um, it's actually um, a kind of arrogance, that's the meaning that goes in with Jahiliya, um, where there is a refusal to even engage and um, I think that um, uh, accepting that in the context of community uh, by so many listeners passively, you know, in the khutbahs where they start bashing, you know, Islamic feminists and stuff like that, um, I think listening to it passively is as much of a problem uh, as it is for the one standing at the member doing it. Um, because um, everyone uh, should be respected um, and everyone has the possibility of having an opinion. So the question is, why is it that certain opinions are not uh, given uh, space and time, you know, or listened to? And to me, I'm, I'm no longer, I mean, I'm an educator. My, my first degree was Bachelor's of Science in Education, and I taught in public schools and private Muslim schools. And then my second two degrees put me into the university, and I taught in universities on several continents. Um, and um, the idea that people think that they can close off this reality um, and that people go along with it to me is a, a disservice uh, to the community um, because um, uh, if there is a, a fair uh, and critical argument to be made, to me, that's the legacy of the Islamic intellectual tradition. That is, make your arguments and give your dalil, give your evidence, um, and have it stand out in the open, transparent, and not as a kind of name-calling, backbiting, tuck fear, trolley type stuff. Um, but that still goes on. Um, and I find it astounding that there are people that sit in the gallery and they let that go on and they don't call it out. Um, uh, I have a, a funny little story. I'll make it short, I promise. Um, uh, Michael Mumisa, uh, uh, who is a scholar uh, in the UK, uh, you know, talked about being in the uh, traditional schools uh, in South Africa, and they, they uh, gave uh, copies of my book so these guys could learn how to refute it, which I thought was very interesting. Of course, the, Michael is black, so he looked at this thing and he said, black and a woman, <laughs> he had a whole different perspective on it. Um, uh, but uh, given the, the length of time, Quran and Woman came out in 1992 when I was just leaving Malaysia. So again, we're talking 30 years. Given the length of time that that small book has been out here, if you have a substantial uh, refutation of the book, then you should be able to make that refutation of the arguments in the book. You don't have to approve of me as Lady Imam and you know queer inclusive. That is not the book. Um, and so um, I am no longer being as generous with the expectation that, oh, if I just make the argument well enough, um, it's going to be taken up as part of this course and you know, we will move on from there. Um, I'm actually calling out uh, the arrogance um, to pretend that after this many decades uh, of these kinds of movements happening at both the scholarly uh, and the policy uh, activist level, uh, that we can just dismiss it. Um, and so that's still a sore point for me. So I'm not being friendly about it, uh, but I just wanted to make that contribution to that question and that comment, Samia. Thank you.
I'm gonna maybe we can end I, um, on, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time today looking back and thinking about the progression of feminist scholarship. Maybe we can spend uh, just the last two minutes of our time together asking the speakers to look forward. What are you most excited about, about the conversations or dialogues or scholarship that are happening now? And could you um, provide us, all of us watching, a call to action? How can we be engaged and what, would, what, what should we do to continue to carry this forward? All right, we will go by age. So Margo, please, and then- Oh my God, all this age. <laughs> what can we do to move forward? Um, of course, it depends naturally where we're moving forward. I mean, you know, geographically and so on. Um, uh, I think um, those of us who are involved in producing knowledge, et cetera, and our scholars, um, we keep doing that. We keep doing the activist piece of what we do. And uh, lots and lots, and at this point in my life, I mean, a lot of it is conversation and uh, speaking one-to-one -one in small groups and so on. And when I was in Egypt, it was actually very exciting uh, because I met a lot of people during the uprisings. And so many of us are still connected and they're much younger than I am. They come from different milieus because in the old days, you'd sort of meet people in your tighter groups. and so we're still in touch with each other and we have these conversations and uh and sometimes they come to me for uh you know for asking ideas i go to them with asking technology trying to understand what they're doing but i think um just being a, a public presence being a source of energy and also they do ask a lot of historical questions because they want to know how they got into the mess that they're into in these society uh, there and over here in the States, I mean, there's just, um, in my broader circles, there's a lot of interest out there. So I think just be uh, maintaining a very vocal, energetic, uh, engaged uh, presence. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, that's what, what I can do. And I'm very, very optimistic, actually, because I do think the new generations are just not putting up with nonsense. A lot of them, anyway, the new folks, and so I think I think we're moving the whole train forward in very good uh, directions. Um, I think I stopped there. Uh, yes, it's my turn mm. to answer this. I want to go back to points that Samir raised that are really, to me, is crucial because it takes us to the realm of politics. And, and also why, you know, people are silent, they are afraid. And the fear really works very, uh, as a um, break. And then another reason is that it goes back to the relationship, uh, this polemics between West and East and legacy of colonialism and everything. So there is a lot of politics there. And also there is a lot of money behind this conservative movement. There is arms money behind it. There is oil money behind it. It is an organized thing. It is really a political thing. But for people like us, just Musaba, you said Musaba. Musaba just to survive, we got to struggle on every level. And you know, the voices like us, we don't have the resources the money behind it and also but we have the knowledge we have the hope and victory uh, and i think the time is for us and i believe that justice one day will pre 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 uh, prevail and i might not be there or not but you know i think each of us have to do our own work and each of us in a way that we can do it and my hope is really like, uh, is on this new voices. I'm not saying that this new only Muslim voices, the new non-Muslim voices that are also inclusive and progressive and Muslim voices that are inclusive and progressive and are not constantly doing this othering. And I see that in the young generation. That is it.
Okay, so um, I, um, I think that it's really important to understand the logistics of networking. Um, I worked as a you know, solitary scholar before I really had an opportunity to network. And you know, that was when I uh, moved to Malaysia to start teaching at the International Islamic University. And I met women who became sisters in Islam. And um, you know, for the three years that I was there, I, I had a network um, and then I left and was isolated again. Um, and so I want to, to speak a little bit about the logistics of networking um, because I think it's important to form a cohesion amongst yourself uh, and uh, smaller collectives so that you don't go crazy. You know, just somebody to st sort of sound off, you know, so that when you have a voice, there's somebody who can hear you and uh, affirm your dignity that you're not crazy you know, or not that kind of crazy. But uh, it's a problem if you stay insulated into those small circles. So the purpose of the small circles is for your well-being um, and for a more intimate kind of uh, interaction with regard to progress, thoughts, the production of knowledge, activism, policy, you know, uh, and the like. Uh, but then that larger group needs, that smaller circle needs to be able to link with larger groups for, for intersectional kinds of projects. We see that's going on now in terms of the global uh, protest movements against discrimination and especially against the state uh, violent uh, enforcement of a certain narrative. Um, the, to, to go out into the, the larger group does not mean that everything about you and that larger group is necessarily in agreement, but you must feed into that because that is how a movement happens, okay? So from a smaller group to a larger group to a movement, but then that also has to feed back. In other words, the movement has to make some acknowledgement and affirmation of the larger groups that has to make some affirmation and acknowledgement of the smaller groups so that there is the, you know, I like the well image, except that, that this is a circle and it goes in both directions. Um, I say that even though I was uh, very limited uh, in the context of networks and I form networks often of just one other person, um, but um, I really feel that, um, you know, to make it work, it needed to come out from behind the veil of sort of erudite scholarly discussion and be challenged by its capacity to fundamentally uh, help shape change uh, and, you know, build uh, towards, you know, uh, paradigm shifts and stuff like that. And I would never have had that if I had, you know, just continued to, you know, just sort of be an isolated scholar. Um, so this feedback, this, this two directional thing, you feed into it, it feeds to a larger group, it makes a movement, and then that movement feeds back to the larger group, and that larger group feeds back to the smaller group, i.e., you know, the individuals in those smaller groups. I think that's one way that it stays, that it, that it maintains some vitality, and that it also helps in terms of, you know, not just getting uh, burnt out uh, in the course of trying to achieve as much as needs to happen. There's a lot that needs to happen and no one person can do it, no one generation, no one group. So you do need to constantly refresh your networks and also to challenge those networks to be accountable back to you as a smaller group. Um, uh, I think I will give my a uh, statement of gratitude to my friends along the way, Professor Dr. Margot Badran and Professor Dr. Ziba Mir Husseini. You have changed my life and I'm so grateful to be on the planet with you at this time. Thanks to all the people in the gallery and those who had questions. I'm sorry if we were not able to get to all of the questions. Um, there will be a sequel to this, an intersectional next generation kind of 
uh, discussion about Islamic feminism. I've already gotten affirmation of two of the four speakers that I have uh, asked. Um, and so uh, look for some kind of um, notification either on the Patreon page or you know elsewhere. And um, for those of you in your day, have a great day. And for those of you in your night, have a great night. Salam alaikum. Thank you. Thank you very much.